Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Musto's, a family-owned restaurant serving Paris, Dyersburg, and Union City for over a decade. Thank you, Zach, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Um, so over the, over the past couple of months, actually, I've d- been discovering the Sean Kenny's Nature Connects Lego exhibit we have here, and it's very interesting seeing the amount of time and Lego bricks it took to to make each exhibit or each lego sculpture in that exhibit uh the fox and rabbits the fox and rabbit for example took 240 hours to build and between the fox and the two rabbits there were 18,908 lego bricks used what of all those out there is your favorite um exhibit your favorite i'm sorry your favorite particular sculpture of the of the legos uh, i really like the uh squirrels in the Bluebirds, are they blue yeah. jays? Bluebirds. Uh, they're blue. Whatever they <laughs> okay. are, they're, they are birds and they are blue. I like the. Um, I really do. I know it's sort of like the premier piece, but I do like the hummingbird. I oh, guess yeah. just because it's so big. You know, mm-hmm. that's really cool. Okay, so our guest today is Grant Som. He's the Cotton Boards Mid South Regional Communications Manager. Maybe he's gotten promotion since I read his his uh, press release. But anyway, so we're we're going to talk about cotton, but we're also going to talk about sheep because that's what I'm I'm really fascinated by. Um, full disclosure: Grant is married to our Discovery Park of America Marketing Director Claire. Um, and he's very, very uh, plugged into everything agriculture here in West Tennessee. So, you know, who knows what we'll talk about. Welcome, Grant. Yes, thank you very much for having me on today and uh, look forward to to diving into sheep and, and anything else agriculture in West Tennessee. Is um, that your, you know, still your like professional title in your real job? You're the... It is. It is. Communications yep. so I've been, manager. I've been about three and a half years with the cotton board going on my fourth and uh, really enjoying enjoying that. So I cover all of the Mid-South, which is up and down the Mississippi River. So uh, pretty much for uh, grower facing, just kind of getting the word out about what the research and promotion program is doing on the behalf of cotton producers and importers. Yeah, the, the cotton board folks were really helpful um, when we did our exhibit on innovation in agriculture. Uh, they contributed a lot. We have a great big giant um, bale of cotton in the exhibit. You know, I thought the other day when I was in there, I wonder how long that's going to last. We might need to replace that at some point. I don't know how long a bale of cotton indoors in the, you know, it's 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 cooled and heated, and so I don't know how long it'll last. Yeah, that's a, that's something I guess I don't have the answer to, but I mean, I think really it would uh, last many, many years. So I I think especially in in climate controlled, I I would think it would be something that uh, lasts for quite a while. But um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. So I know that um, you grew up around sheep, which is which is one of the things we're going to talk about today. Back us up to I know you and your dad and your brother, um, you guys were raising sheep very early on. And I've read that a lot of your earliest memories, you know, involve being um, you know, in a barn and around sheep. So tell us a little bit about where you came from. Right. Yep. So I, uh, I'm originally from Raymer, Tennessee, which is just north of the Mississippi line, uh, just north of Corinth, right there on Highway 45. So, um, yeah, the sheep memories, I guess, go back to when I was four years old, uh, is the first time I actually started showing sheep or was around, you know, livestock in general. And, uh, you know, since then we started Psalm show stock in, in 2010, I guess is the, the year that we, we claim to have started actually raising and selling the sheep. But, uh, you know, memories date back all the way back to when I was four years old and, and me and my older brother actually, uh, you know, got our first sheep projects and, and we had a trailer, but didn't see it was necessary to hook up or anything. So we actually put them both in the back of the truck and, and held on to them while we had to go a mile or two up the road and and things like that, which there's many stories that can can be told about some of the early days of us trying to figure out the the sheep project. But uh, so your dad, um, what was his background that got him interested in sheep? 
Yeah, so he actually is uh, from from kind of central Mississippi around Columbus area. And uh, they they kind of jumped into the 4-H side of things and, and had 4-H projects with um, cattle, sheep, and hogs. So uh, he, you know, he started showing lambs at a young age and, and it kind of just kind of followed through um, to, to me, you know, whenever I was young as well. But I guess uh, my grandmother kind of started all being a, a volunteer with the 4-H extension group there in Mississippi and was a was a long-standing uh, volunteer in the 4-H kind of traditions in Mississippi and things like that so I guess I have to put it all back to to my grandmother that started the fire of uh, not only agriculture but livestock specifically so when you when you think about sheep and you think about you know the south are there specific areas that are more uh the environment and the uh climate makes it a better place to raise sheep right right no that's actually a really good question so the south in general is extremely humid and actually probably isn't the most uh the the best area to raise sheep actually you know they're kind of if you think about just the long-standing history of sheep uh you know they're kind of more of a, a desert sheep or they actually have hooves you know which are more prone to uh, probably better for rocky areas and things like that. But, um, you know, in our area, we make it work for sure. So it's, it's uh, you know, we definitely face a few things with the humidity and, and the amount of rainfall that we get. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely more of a Western animal, I guess I would say, kind of in more of a rocky climate and an arid, uh, drier clim- climate. But um, you know, we kind of deal with the cards we're dealt when it comes to to being in the mid south or being in the south in general when it comes to the sheep side of things. So here's a here's a moment of sheep history that I can contribute to the con. This is my only real contribution. So uh, when David Crockett was on his book tour, he went to a mill in Lowell, Massachusetts, and they presented him with, you know, he was a celebrity and they presented him with gifts everywhere he went. And so this mill in Lowell, Massachusetts gave him a suit that they had made in their uh, factory out of uh, wool that they had purchased from Mark R. Cockerell, the nephew of James Robertson, who was one of the founders of Nashville. And uh, Mark Cockerell had a 5,000 acre farm outside of Nashville and he traveled around the world trying to find the best sheep that would be raised in Nashville. And he settled upon some kind of Merino sheep. Um, and that is what he raised. So Merino is actually a very kind of, uh, they call it a higher end wool. I guess it's a fine wool. So I actually have a suit coat or one of my suits are made out of fine wool Merino, uh, wools as well. So it's actually that back in the day, I would assume that that would be a very nice gift or, you know, something that was very treasured, uh, just simply because you know it was kind of unique for its time. For when sure. they were using it as they were using it as an an example of the relationship between the North and the South, you know, and the South creating you know the the fibers that then went up, um, you know, to the mills there. Um, so I just got back from Scotland and there were sheep literally everywhere. So um, and I know there's like a Tennessee sheep association or something um do y'all go on like trips to scotland to look at the other sheeps in the other countries right right no i i actually haven't been um i guess across the pond pond or across seas to see some of the huge operations over there uh you know they're a little bit different in the sheep from the sheep that we have or from what we focus on you know we're really focused more on the uh the show lamb industry i guess with some show stock so um, we we focus on kind of 4-H and FFA kids having their projects to to take to either their county fair or to state and national shows and things like that. But I know across seas, you know, they have multiple thousands of sheep uh, roaming the countryside and, and things like that. You know, and they they have some better climate as well as just you know more more land and and more availability to some of the things that it takes to raise that many sheep on on one place but uh would love to be able to get across seas to to see some of that stuff well i toured one and 
I toured one farm and they were saying that they had some of their sheep had just been sheared. They were saying it was more expensive to shear their sheep than they could sell the wool for. So a lot of times they did it more symbolically and, you know, just to keep the old traditions alive. And, you know, and I guess a sheep has to be sheared. Take us, take us through some of the things about raising sheep like that. Do they have to be, can they walk around with just never being haircut? you know, and, uh, things like that. Tell us a little bit about raising sheep. Right. Yeah. So, um, a sheep, mo- mostly wool sheep, there are wool and hair sheep actually, but, uh, we raise kind of a Hampshire cross. So they do have to be sheared twice a year. So, uh, I guess a sheep could just, you know, live multiple years, you know, out in the wild with not being shorn or anything like that. But, Uh, Definitely with as warm as it gets in the summer, you know, with temperatures raising well above 100 the past couple of weeks, uh, we tried to to make sure to shear them twice a year. And um, this helps not only with the body temperature, but um, they also have lanolin in their wool. So, you know, it's a natural fly deterrent or insect deterrent. So uh, we try to shear them before it gets too too hot because it actually uh, can shield some of that heat as well. So as it starts growing again and it gets you know three quarters to an of an inch to an inch of wool it starts actually creating uh, a barrier to the climate as well so it can actually keep them cooler in in the in the months of of hot dry summer heat you know things like that but um i don't know how how deep you want me to go into it but uh we you know we raise sheep it's a you want me to go into like the breeding Heck yeah. Yeah. Tell us all about it. Um, I, I looked at some of your, some of the sheep that you sell online, um, that, uh, or that your business sells. Um, and you know, I mean, first of all, they make a lot of, they sell for, a, you know, to me, a lot of money. I, I didn't know she, you know, you could sell a sheep for that much money. And it was really interesting to look at the comments, uh, the descriptions, um, like I'm looking at this one right here. Um, it's a weather as far as I didn't even know that was a word when you described that. I thought they were male and female. This is a weather, right? So a weather is actually a castrated male and there's multiple, you know, benefits to doing that, but it's mainly just, we obviously don't want a ton of rams running around. They become, you know, a little bit mean or, you know, they just, they also don't translate feet or, um, you know, convert feed as as efficient as a weather does as well. So uh, that's that's what a weather would be. And most of our show lambs will either be a weather or a ewe lamb. So a ewe lamb is a, a female that has not had a lamb yet. So uh, that's what a ewe lamb would be considered as well. And then and then the breed is a hemp cross. Right, right. So you know, we're kind of in a unique. Um, area of the industry and the fact of the show lambs. So, you know, we're breeding multiple different breeds to, to kind of bring out the best of each of those breeds, whether that be uh, muscle or, uh, you know, structural soundness or things like that. So it's kind of, you know, uh, we, we like to, you know, I don't know if we'd like to say it, but we kind of explain it as, you know, similar to a dog show or we call it like a dog and pony show, you know, it's definitely about trying to get the, the appearance of a sheep, or of our lambs to to kind of strike the judge as it walks into the ring and show kind of the the good aspects of the lamb that it has, whether that be heavy muscled, uh, structural soundness, and just overall eye eye appeal. Whenever you're looking at the lambs as well in the show ring. And then it's it's uh, important I uh, take from the stuff that I've looked at that who the sire was. This particular one I'm looking at was walking tall. Um, and say when X Savannah. So they all have these, you know, crazy, <laughs> clever names. Do you right. come up with, with uh, names for your uh, sheep? Yeah, yeah. So we actually, uh, Walking Tall is a, a ram we raised actually on our farm. And uh, it kind of goes back to the Buford Pusser days. You know, everywhere I go, I say I'm from McNary County and, and they say, oh, Buford Pusser. So, you know, it's just something kind of that the history has. And, uh, we, uh, that's kind of how we settled on that ram name. But yeah, the genetics is kind of how we uh, can maybe forecast what those lambs are going to look like and, and feed out like whenever it comes to showing them and things like that. So uh, genetics and kind of the names of the different males and females uh, that contribute that 
to that lamb's de deposition and things like that really means a lot uh, when it comes to to kind of our industry and, and all of those things. So, so the folks that are on here, I'm going to bid on I'm going to bid on this Werther Hemp Cross from Walking Tall. Say when Exovana. What am I going? Why am I going to pay seven hundred dollars for this? For this so they're lamb. bidding on the sheep. Yeah, they're bidding. It's like oh, a, wow. it's like a, a, it's like an eBay for sheep. <laughs> um, so what, what am I going to do with this lamb? Right, right. So yeah, we do have, uh, you know, in everything technology these days, we actually have online sales. So you know, there's platforms out there where you know it opens up at seven a.m. and then it closes at seven p.m. and goes into kind of like a. Uh, a bit off there at the end of the sale and things like that. So it's been great with technology. Uh, there's live sales as well. And then we always, you know, like to have people come by and take a look at the lambs as well uh, and visit our farm there in, in Raymer, Tennessee. Um, but, you know, most of them, like I said earlier, goes to 4-H and FFA projects. So, uh, I, you know, kids from, like I said, I started at four years old all the way until 18 to 21 years of age. Uh, you know, the kids in between those ages, uh, they usually buy them in the spring and, uh, and then we'll feed them out throughout the summer into the fall and then even into some spring and winter shows as well. And uh, take them to your local county fairs or your national state fairs, uh, national shows such as the North American and Louisville, Kentucky. So, uh, you know, there's multiple things that you do throughout out the year, but mostly it's, you know, just trying to have a feed program. Um, actually even an exercise program as well. So there's treadmills and, and things like that, that the sheep industry uses as well, you know, to build muscle and, and it boils down to, I mean, just like multiple other things or competitive events, you know, those sheep are athletes. They're, they get treated like, like athletes. They get, um, you know, they get fed a high, you know, protein diet to, to be able to maximize their muscle and uh, things like that. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, sometimes I, I joke and say that these lambs and, and even cattle and things like that, they get treated better than I do sometimes <laughs> when it comes to, to eating a, a top of the line diet or, uh, you know, being in, in air condition or, you know, being air, fans blowing on them all the time and things like that. So, uh, it's a, it's a great project overall. I, I, I owe a lot of my work ethic as well as just, um, you know, being able to interact with other people. Uh, to the livestock industry and and it's one of the best industries that I, I recommend parents and grandparents to um, to definitely look into you know if you have a, a child that either likes to be outdoors or you know wants to interact with livestock it's a it's a great opportunity to be able to kind of have a little bit of responsibility and uh, just take some of that responsibility to feed them twice a day and uh, really take care of them and kind of groom them to uh to try to be successful in the show ring now at some point i'm assuming these uh sheeps become lamb chops or lamb burgers or whatever is that always the case I mean, is that really what the end game is either to breed them and at some point eat them right right yeah so there's you know there's there's definitely different sectors when it comes to that i mean yes the end game ends up you know they get turned into to lamb meat and things like that. So I actually just started last year my own kind of operation away from Psalm Show Stock, uh, where it's uh, actually Real Foot Meat Company. So I took the Real Foot, you know, from where we're from here in Northwest Tennessee, and that large stack that sits in the middle of town that kind of is a staple point to Union City. And I kind of took that, and that's what I named my operation about. So I actually raised hair sheep, so Katahdin and Katahdin Dorper crosses, and they're strictly for meat. So uh, I raise them, they're a hair sheep, so they don't actually have to be shorn twice a year. They naturally kind of lose their hair or shed their hair in the spring months. Uh, so they're kind of a lower maintenance type sheep, and that's what ends up um, kind of, that's what I was looking at when I, I was looking at a type of sheep to kind of start that operation. And uh, so, yeah, those actually are kind of bred and, and raised specifically for meat. So those are, you know, we wean them around the three month time frame and, uh, and then raise them for another, you know, six to, to 12 months and still want to try to, you know, heart, um, process them before they turn a year old just for tenderness and for, uh, you know, taste of meat. But it's actually a, 
I don't know if I'd call it a delicacy, but it's definitely a higher end meat whenever you start thinking about beef or uh, pork, chicken, things like that. So you go to the grocery store and it definitely has kind of more of a premium uh, or a restaurant, especially, you know, the higher end restaurants uh, charge a premium whenever it comes to lamb meat and things like that. So, so yeah, the end, you know, the end goal in both operations, you know, the lambs turn into meat, uh, you know, but kind of in the Psalm show stock, we uh, first are for genetics and uh, for, for being able to raise breeding stock and things like that. And then yes, at the end, it, it ends up turning into lamb meat as well. So Zach, have you ever uh, cooked lamb chops or lamb burgers? I've never cooked lamb chops, but I've ate some good lamb chops. <laughs> um, Claire was kind enough to gift me some of your uh, meat, Grant, and I sent her, I don't know if she shared them, but I sent her pictures of it after I cooked it. Very, very good. Right, right. No, it, it looked good. It looked like you, you knew how to cook it. That's the biggest thing about lamb meat is you, you got to be able to cook it right. And, you know, at restaurants and things like that, especially if you have a chef that knows what he's doing, I mean... It, it's melting your mouth good and it's truly a, it's a great flavor whenever it comes to, to someone being able to cook it right for sure. Now there's a, there's another, um, I was riding my bike this, this weekend and there's a, I don't know if Claire told you, I told her about it. There's a sheep farm over by my house. Um, I don't know if you're for, do you know those folks? And I know of them. I know yeah. of them or whatnot. But well, they've gotten all their, you know, they were fluffy sheep. And then uh, the other day I noticed they're all, now they're all like skin, you know, like they're, they've been shorn and they they've were huddled up shorn. on, right. there's probably a hundred of them. It almost looked like Scotland, you know, to see them all huddled up, you know, in the barn, but they were definitely hot. It was hot in Tennessee right, right now. Right. Yeah. It's uh, the, the Tennessee heat can definitely get to them, especially the humidity and things like that. But uh, you know, they're adaptive animals, so they, they try to, they get out of the, the beaming sun and, and definitely getting some of the wool off of them helps them kind of moderate their body temperatures a little bit better. You know, there, there, there was a, I guess it was a fad. I don't know if people still do it, but there was a time when people were raising little pot belly pigs in their houses and then they would get bigger and bigger and bigger. I had a cousin, Shay. And his wife, Don, who had a pot belly pig that started off and pretty soon, I mean, that sucker was as big as my desk. Um, do people, does anybody out there raise sheep as like a, is, is it in any way a domestic kind of a pet kind of thing? Uh, I mean, not, not really that <laughs> I know of. I mean, there's definitely bottle lambs or, you know, lambs that maybe have lost their, their mother or something like that, that they might bring into the house and, and make sure that they kind of can get on their feet and kind of be able to defend for themselves but uh, I, I wouldn't think most of them are domestic you know usually they're they're outside animals and and they run the they love you know running pasture and, and eating grass and and uh things like that so i i don't you can't know litter box you don't, but, you don't litter box train uh a sheep uh not not my way that'll never happen uh it, <laughs> you know my wife and that's definitely not going to happen in my house but uh you know, usually we might have to bring one in, like I said, for a day or two just to, to make sure that it gets going. But uh, past that, they, they will not be domesticated on my side side of it. So, Has there ever been one, just one sheep that you thought, man, this is the smartest sheep I have ever raised who you hesitated to uh, take them to the place butcher. where they, you thank you, the butcher. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely smart animals, you know, in the in the showing side of things, you can definitely get smarter animals that are, you know, know what they're doing or know the job at hand uh, compared to others, you know, because uh, the showing industry is all about presentation and being able to walk them around the ring and get them set up and things like that. So, I mean, you definitely, uh, like I said earlier, you know, you can tell the good athletes from the bad athletes and uh, the ones that kind of know what what's going on and being able to work with, uh, you know, their handler or the showman in the ring, you definitely can tell the ones that, that handle better and work better for you. But you've never walked in the house and said, Claire, this is a superstar. This one's got, we gotta, we've got to keep this one in our house or in our backyard. She's not uh, in the <laughs> house or the backyard. No way uh, <laughs> at any time, but we have, I've definitely walked in the house and just, rant and raved about you know how good of a lamb is or uh you know what we're going to breed to next you know there's a lot of time and effort that goes into to um 
to picking out what the genetics are going to be, you know, trying to uh, pick and choose and kind of, you know, highlight the benefits of maybe one ram so that you can breed it to a ewe and things like that to kind of complement some of the good attributes that that the sheep have and things like that. So, I mean, there's there's multiple times that I'm I'm talking to Claire or, you know, talking to my family about, you know, what the genetics we're going to breed to or what's uh, kind of on the horizon, you know, what are we going to do next? And uh, I'm sure she gets tired of hearing about it, but it's it's kind of always on your mind or always kind of looking to see, you know, how you can make your operation better or make that next winning show lamb. I'm going to ask one more sheep question and then we're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to talk about the fabric of our lives. Um, so for anyone who is listening, who doesn't know you, you are soon to have a little girl in your life. Are you guys going like with a whole lamb decorating scheme in your nursery? And are you going to name her Mary? So you can say Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> well, Mary may be, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in the name at some point, but has nothing to do with the sheep side of things oh. or anything like that. But of course you got to, you know, you got to put it somewhere in the nursery or she has, you know, a, a lamb to, to sleep with or things like that. So there's definitely a uh, little tidbits or little things that uh, fit into Hardy as well as the, the new addition, you know, to kind of make sure that they, they know the farm animals and things like that. Well, somewhere I read that you had said that you were looking forward to passing along, you know, the passion for for sheep and lambs on to the next generation. And this was back before you, I could tell it was back before you had um, a kid. So now you've got a kid. So how are you introducing Hardy to the world of agriculture? Right, right. Yeah, no, it, I think that that's definitely kind of our responsibility as, as parents or people in agriculture is to pass it down to the next generation and, and kind of just show them you know, what the good things that it brought to, you know, creating the guy I am today or things like that. But, you know, we take him out there and, uh, you know, he's not quite big enough to help carry the buckets or anything like that, but he, he loves feeding or feeding them and, and water them, watering them. You know, he usually plays in the water trough more than he actually gets water in the trough, but, you know, it's just taking the time with them and, and then exposing them, you know, not only to the outdoors, but to the to the livestock operation and, and just showing, you know, what it takes to, to raise an animal and, and can't wait for the days that he, you know, can get out there and, and be side by side, whether it's helping lamb out the ewes or, you know, raising the baby lambs and, and just taking care of them. It's definitely something that I look forward uh, to, to continue to instill in them and, and just show him the ropes of, of being able to you know, raise an animal, let alone a sheep, but just raise them from the time that it's born and, and showing the, you know, the fresh new life that we have every spring and, and things like that. So it's definitely a, it's an honor to be able to have, you know, land and be able to, to raise livestock, but it'll be even more exciting whenever I can kind of pass it down to that next generation and, and pass it down to the kids as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about cotton. Musto's Pasta and Grill is a family-owned restaurant serving Paris, Dyersburg, and Union City for over a decade. Their diverse menu of authentic Italian dishes includes everything from savory pasta and sandwiches to fresh salads. The next time you visit Discovery Park, check out their brand new Union City restaurant at 2205 West Realfoot Avenue. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Grant Somm, who is uh, very plugged into agriculture of this region. Uh, when we left Grant, we were talking about the importance of passing along uh, the appreciation and the passion for uh, raising livestock uh, to the next generation. Um, there's some uh, STEM, science, technology aspects to this as well that'll give kids a heads up. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how these animals are, are bred and how you take two very smart award-winning uh, sheep and create an award-winning smart lamb. Right, right. So, 
Um, you know, I talked about earlier just about, you know, talking the genetics or looking to see kind of what we're going to do for the next generation when it comes to the lands and things like that. And as something that's really been able to move our operation forward with it being a, a smaller operation uh, is, is what they call artificial insemination and embryo transfer. So uh, it's, it's actually being able to take any buck from a cost across the country, you know, which some of these bucks can can reach the prices of, you know, six digits, you know, and things like that. So not, you know, being a small operation, we might not be able to afford the top of the line genetics, but uh, the AI, which is uh, not artificial intelligence, but in artificial insemination and uh, really being able to take that top of the line uh, ram and being able to breed our sheep has really taken our operation to the next, to the next step. And, and been able to, you know, be more competitive and things like that. So it's actually, uh, you know, a veterinarian comes in and uh, we actually set up our use. So uh, we take them through a, a process of, of, of different um, or a protocol of different medicines that uh, kind of, you know, starts to get the the ewe into heat. And, uh, and then we time it perfectly to be able to breed it right whenever she's ovulating uh, to be able to, to make to be able to breed her and uh, we might be able to breed one buck uh, to 25 or 30 different ewes all within an hour or two, you know, whereas in, in the natural area, you know, one buck, yes, he can cover 25 or 30, uh, but he wouldn't be able to cover it all within, you know, two or three days. He would, he would, he may skip a cycle or things like that. So it's really been able to kind of condense our lambing uh, timing. You know, we, we have, you know, all of our lambs within five to 10 days. Uh, whereas, you know, in the natural process that could last over four or five months. So uh, it's really been able to kind of uh, increase our efficiency and be able to increase our genetics as well as kind of just the, the uh, how good our lambs are and things like that. And then the embryo side of things, uh, you actually artificial inseminate them, but you also uh, super ovulate them. So, you know, not to get too deep into the science of things, but, you know, uh, user have a certain amount of eggs from the moment that they were born. So, um, you know, being able to, to be able to set them up for embryo transfer, it's actually able to be able to flush out numerous eggs and then be able to put those eggs into what they call either surrogates, uh, in the humans, uh, but we call them recips. So, that's kind of where I created my side um, of the operation and my flock is to be able to, you know, raise recips to put some of those eggs in and uh, really try to push the needle and push forward of uh, being able to raise, you know, high, not only high dollar, but high quality livestock uh, to take to the show, show lamb industry and to be able to sell to, you know, those 4-H and FFA members across the country. How often is it successful? You know, the, are there times when you when you're artificially inseminating and it's just a complete disaster and it didn't work and the sheep's not pregnant? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely those those times. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the summer, the Tennessee summer heat is definitely not the most conducive to it sometimes. But, um, you know, we have around a 60 percent success rate on the the AI. So, you know, that's that's kind of average. You know, and then the embryo transfer, you know, you can have anywhere from one to two eggs to up around 20 and 30 eggs or 20 and 30 uh, lambs to one flush. So, uh, you know, it's all over the board. There's a lot of things we do to try to, you know, help take care of the ewes and the rams both to make sure that they're uh, the most successful in that. And uh, but, you know, there's definitely times where it's a complete bust and we're left scratching our heads or looking around you know, thinking what, where did we go wrong or what do we do that we can change for the future and things like that. And then what's, what is it, what is it like when you have 20, 30 sheep about to have babies all at the same time? Are you sleeping at the barn? Do you have a vet comes and helps handle any challenges? Yeah. So we definitely have a vet on speed dial. I, I wouldn't say that we necessarily have him come by the farm, you know, with multiple years under our belt, we've kind of seen a little bit of all of it. So we, uh, we definitely know how to, you know, react to it, but it's definitely sleepless nights, um, a lot of staying up at the barn and and not going to bed at night because they love to to wait all day. You know, when you're up and down at the barn, they love to wait until the nighttime to 
to go into labor and things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's actually really nice because, you know, instead of that being spread over three to four months, you know, it's spread over 10 days. So uh, we're able to really focus in on, um, you know, getting the lambs on the ground, being able to really take care of the ewes. And if any of them have any trouble, you know, try to be there to help them uh, either with the labor or right after the labor to, to kind of get the, the lambs up on their feet and to, to really get them going because the, you know, the first 24 to 48 hours really means, means the most of the fact of just getting those lambs off to a good start and, you know, get them nursing and things like that. So uh, a lot of sleepless nights, but actually really enjoy being able to kind of condense the breeding uh, window so that we can really focus and, uh, and get all of the ewes into the barn and, and really focus on them one-on-one. -on -one. And then you just open the barn door and let them run around and eat grass and that kind of thing? Right, right. So we actually keep the ewe with its lamb for the first three, you know, two to three days just to, so that they can bond and, and they don't get mixed up with other lambs or um, any other uh, ewes or, you know, no ewe headbutts another lamb or things like that. So we really uh, keep them with their mother for two or three days and then we turn them out into a bigger pen. And uh, that's when they really start kind of coming alive and the lambs start getting the, the zoomies or, you know, start running around the pen and really start jumping around. And it's, it's a pretty neat sight to see whenever you have, you know, 40 or 50 lambs all on the, the farm and, and they all kind of are running around loose and, and excited just for uh, another day. So it's a pretty, you know, there's a lot of rewards when it comes to agriculture, but to raising livestock in general, you get to see a lot of uh, things that, you know, make you happy or you get to see some of the bright spots when it comes to raising livestock and, and raising a young as well. Do you have one of those really groovy sheep dogs who will run out and, you know, like an Australian shepherd that'll guide them around? Right. No, I don't actually, but that is definitely on the, the bucket list. Maybe as, uh, as things settle down or maybe as the kids grow up and I would love to have a border collie or an Australian shepherd because it's truly, I mean, those are working dogs, you know, those are dogs that know what, what they're supposed to do. And it's a really a sight to see, to be able to see them, you know, get the, get the use up or bring them out of the pasture and get them into a pen and things like that. That's a, that's a really neat stock dogs are really neat to be able to see kind of at work and things like that. Now let's switch from wool to cotton. Um, obviously cotton, you know, and the South, you know, the South was built on cotton. Um, and you know, I'm wearing cotton, um, cotton, everybody wears cotton. Um, up here in, I have noticed, I don't know much about cotton, but I know that my family's from Haywood County and that's all they farmed was cotton. I had a great grandfather who supplemented his cotton income by walking down the road and picking up the cotton that had fallen off of the cotton trailer. So I'm sure he didn't make a whole lot that way, but um, you know, tell us a little bit about the state of cotton today in the South. Um, I know that they, st if you drive down from, if you drive from here to Memphis, you're going to run across, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of cotton being grown. Um, so a lot of our listeners don't even know anything about cotton. So, you know, what's up with cotton today? Right, right. So it's actually really interesting that I've I've chosen career paths both in natural fibers, you know, with the wool as well as the cotton fiber. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of very positive things when it comes to, to both of the fibers, but specifically cotton. Um, you know, cotton's grown from Virginia to California throughout which they call the cotton belt. Um, so it's definitely a warm natured um, crop. So you know, used to be the the South was full of wall to wall cotton, and uh, you know things have changed a little bit. Cotton is still and will always be king for sure. Um, but but with different things coming along, such as grain, you know, corn, beans, and wheat, uh, you know, some of those acres have got displaced with some of the grain crops and things like that. But uh, usually, if you're talking to a cotton farmer, uh, it's in their blood. You know, it's something that their their dad or their granddads or multiple generations have grown cotton so it's definitely once once you're in the industry it definitely gets in your blood and and is definitely something that you um you know something that's just that you do naturally it's something that you want always on your farm 
and uh, it's a natural fiber. So, you know, it's compared to other man-made fibers, it's something that is naturally grown from the earth, grown from the soil, you know, that the growers uh, work and, and things like that. So uh, I work for the research and promotion program, and it was founded back in the 70s uh, whenever polyesters or man-made fibers were really starting to kind of take hold with uh, leisure jumpsuits or things like that. So uh, a group of cotton producers actually came together to create the the cotton pro uh, research and promotion program. So uh, they saw that they were going to have to continue to to tell the good things about uh, the cotton fiber and, and be able to have someone kind of advocating for the cotton industry. So uh, that's something that I'm proud to be a part of. Uh, my my job specifically is, is a job that we uh, collect the assessments of each bale of cotton that is harvested and ginned in the United States. So we take that money along with money that's uh, collected through importing cotton as well. So cotton goods, you know, whether that be the t-shirt you have on, the button up we wear to work or things like that, we actually collect those assessments as well and uh, take that money to create the demand and profitability for cotton. So those are the kind of the things that the research and promotion programs faced with or, you know, works towards uh, doing with those assessment dollars. Um, but as far as the state of cotton, you know, like I said, the acres might have dropped, but but uh, the, the genetics and the different cotton farming pra practices have definitely uh, improved and has definitely moved forward with technology and things like that. So we've, uh, you know, been able to cut our water usage, you know, in half and been able to really uh, create more fiber on a, a piece of land or an acre of land, uh, you know, three or four times over what we used to be able to do back in the 70s and 80s. So, uh, you know, just like anything, we're trying to be efficient and uh, sustainable when it comes to growing cotton and growing the fabric of our lives. You know, we have a whole um, exhibit on innovation and in agriculture out at the Simmons Bank Ag Center here at Discovery Park, and there's a section of it on cotton and on, you know, the history of growing cotton. And uh, one of the things a lot of people may not be familiar with is um, how bow, bow weevils uh, really impacted still how people farm cotton, and it really threatened uh, the success of cotton crops a few years ago. It, it most definitely did. The boll weevil is probably single-handedly um, an insect that, you know, almost brought the cotton industry to its knees, you know. Uh, but luckily, we we don't face the boll weevil near as much as what they did in the past. Uh, with the boll weevil eradication program, we've actually been able to to do away with the boll weevil. Uh, it's not completely, you know, taken care of, but there's a certain area in uh, northern Mexico and kind of the southern Texas area where it is still um, around and definitely prevalent. But um, yeah, the boll weevil is something that actually it's a, in, it's a piercing insect. So uh, the insect actually uses kind of a long snout and pierces the cotton bowl. And as soon as it pierces into the cotton bowl, um, it, it really rots or decays after that. So it, it sucks out the, the nutrients of the cotton bowl. And, and after it's been pierced, uh, it just sits in the field and kind of rots away or, you know, decays away. So therefore you aren't, aren't able to actually harvest it after that. So, um, you know, luckily we don't have to face the boll weevil and we're able to be, uh, continue to be very efficient when it comes to growing cotton. So what's next for you in the whole world of cotton and sheep? And are you going to try to start raising polyesters or what, you know, what, what, what's your future? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's something I guess you think about a lot. Um, you, you don't really raise polyester. You know, polyester is a man-made fabric, <laughs> but uh, definitely, you know, enjoy being a part of both of the natural fibers. I, I always encourage people to check the label, uh, whether that be with wool or especially with cotton. You know, cotton is definitely a fabric that has been around for a long time. There's a lot of great aspects when it comes to, to wearing cotton or to using cotton, cotton. Uh, whether that be, you know, cottonseed oil or cotton as far as the fabric and things like that. So uh, as far as the future, you know, I, I love what I do on both of the fibers as far as raising sheep. Uh, I continue, I, I look forward to continue raising the sheep for the show lamb industry as well as the meat industry and uh, bringing the next generation into it. 
And, uh, you know, hopefully Hardy and, and the next baby that comes along is interested in livestock and we can kind of take them through the show, show industry. And uh, we always joke that's kind of the travel ball uh, when it comes to showing is that's the where we spend our weekends and kind of how we raise our children. So excited for, you know, to see what the future holds with that. And uh, as far as the cotton industry, you know, I look forward to continuing to to spread the good word about cotton and about how it's a natural fiber and and uh, it's sustainably grown and, and things like that when it comes to the textile industry. Uh, just, you know, encourage people to understand where their clothing uh, and their food is coming from. I think it's something that's very important to, you know, as we start talking about sustainability and, and trying to make sure that we leave it better than we found it when it comes to, you know, the land or uh, just the earth in general. I think it's something that's definitely um, something that, you know, the cotton industry is is focused on. It's something that we definitely want to be relevant when it comes to 2050, you know, 2025, 2050, and the next generations. We definitely want the cotton industry to continue to, to be relevant and to be around and uh, to be good stewards of the land moving forward. Yeah, I've been Zach comes to work wearing a lot of polyester jumpsuits and I keep telling him, you know, Zach, cotton or wool is the way to go. So, well, thank you for joining us, Grant. We really appreciate it. This has really been fascinating. Yeah, I really appreciate you having having me on the the podcast. I was listening to different podcasts, you know, getting ready to be on and there's a lot of different aspects of Western Tennessee that you've covered and it's it's really an awesome podcast to to kind of highlight not only Northwest Tennessee, but Tennessee in general, and to also tell a little bit about what Discovery Park of America has to offer uh, to, to rural West Tennessee. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you to all you listeners who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.